next esteemed uh, faculty is Dr. Tiny Nair, very dear and near to us. Dr. Tiny Nair, all of us know, is the head department of cardiology, PRS Hospital, Trivandrum. He has received uh, several awards. The Best Doctor Award, Government of Kerala 2006. is the most inspiring doctor of India Economic Time 2019. Best Reviewer Annals of Internal Medicine. He's on editorial board of several journals, national and international. He has four books and he has 45 publications in various national and international journals. I'll hand over the mic to Dr. Rohit Modi, Sandeep Rai and Dr. Padma Gulati to conduct this session. I'll invite Dr. Modi to start the session. Dr. Rohit Modi, please. Dr. Tiny Nair, before I start, I must thank PC Manoria and his entire team for inviting me as a chairperson. Everybody knows, and PC Manoria um, already gave an introduction of Tiny Nair. So we will now eagerly waiting for Tiny Nair's lecture on heart failure. Tiny Nair, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir, for the introduction. So the topic is uh, heart failure treatment 2020. But uh, there's an addition. There is an alert and message, important messages for the practicing uh, physicians. Uh, my disclosures. Now, the first things first, we know that uh, heart failure, heart failure indeed is a bad disease. There's no doubt, everybody would agree that heart failure would be a bad disease. But the first point is there is something which is even worse, something even worse than heart failure. And what is it? Let's have a look at it. This is one of those uh, articles that came in 2015-16 by Dr. Graham Cole, who is from the Imperial uh, College, London, United Kingdom. Uh, he wrote a very interesting article, uh, which labeled triple therapy of heart failure. And he said the benefits of triple therapy, he put it in a different way, triples survival time. He said many often we don't understand as how good the therapies that we use today are for benefit of heart failure. And uh, the, the graph looks very interesting, where he showed that if you take, for example, the baseline, straight line there at one year and add up its inhibitors, for example, so you move up there, right? You add up beta blockers, you go further, and you add up aldosterone antagonists, and you go there. So basically, if you are prescribing ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and aldosterone antagonists to your patient, you kind of triple their survival time, their lifespan, which indeed is a very, very interesting way of putting how beneficial these drugs are. Now, for a moment, let us hold on there and look at our own data. This is data from Trivandrum Heart Failure Registry. We, we were all part of it which was headed, conceptualized, and run by Dr. Harikrishnan from Sri Chitra Institute. Uh, we were very happy because in 2015, it got published in the American Heart Journal. Frequently, <coughs> we saw it coming out in the European Heart Journal. We got it published in Indian Heart Journal, the International Journal of Cardiology, and the Journal of Cardiac Failure. We learned a lot from this data of 1,250 patients in random heart failure registry. But most importantly is this. Yes, that is what we said. Heart failure is a bad disease with a 50% mortality at five years in the Indian population. In our population, 50% mortality at five years. But hold on, there's something even more interesting, and this is this. If we look at the data, this is a 100-day follow-up post-discharge of our patients of random heart failure history. And on the x-axis, on the y-axis, we have the cumulative mortality. Okay, very hard endpoint. So we see that the outcomes are bad, the blue line. But when we take out patients who had been prescribed guideline-directed medical therapy, GDMT, okay, meaning ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and aldosterone antagonists, their outcome was good. In fact, they had one-third lower mortality at 100 days, provided we, as doctors, had prescribed them on these three guideline-directed medical therapy. But unfortunately, only 24% of our patients, only a quarter of our patients received GDMT and 76% didn't. So what are we talking about? GDMT at that point of time 
2015 meant only ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and aldosterone antagonists. So when we looked at the factors associated with the five-year mortality in our patient data, trivandrum heart failure registry, uh, the good point we found that age is a driver of mortality. Heart hazard, hazard ratio 1.22, class 2, class 3, class 4, 2.3, 3.2. But if you look at the negative drivers, protective ones, you prescribe a beta blocker at discharge and you get a hazard ratio of 0.55. Which means you are reducing your patient risk by 45% mortality risk at five years if you just prescribe a beta blocker to your patient. Now, for a moment, look at it in a different way so that you would understand what we are talking about. This is the data, again, came from Imperial College London, uh, which looked at the mortality risk of deferring optimal medical treatment in heart failure. So, deferring optimal medical treatment in heart failure. Why are we talking about that? Look at that data. If you say one year survival, so mortality figure is 10%, let's say one year in the data. Now, if you defer adding an aldosterone antagonist, look at that. You add up a 3% additional burden of mortality. If you defer writing a beta blocker in that green, you add up 4.8% mortality. You add up deferring ACE inhibitors, you defer ACE inhibitors in your patient, you add up another 4.4%. Hold on, so what are we talking about? This is the first concept that if we are talking about the disease of heart failure, it is bad, right? So disease mortality is there. But today, if we look at the physician inertia, if we don't prescribe guideline-directed medical therapy of aldosterone antagonists, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, it is huge. In fact, today for the first time, we see that physician inertia, because we have very good drugs, is much more than disease mortality. So I think that is the first concept, that physician inertia today is worse than heart failure itself. Because today we have very good drugs, but unless we write it for our patients, they will not benefit. So message one for the physicians, heart failure is a bad disease, but physician inertia is worse. Now, subsequently we got DAPA HF trial, which showed the DAPA glyphosate reduced Heart failure, uh, death and worsening heart failure by 26%. Emperor showed empagliflozin, reducing heart failure, hospitalization, cardiovascular death by 25%. Paradigm, sorry, paradigm showing, step there. Yeah, paradigm showing that army reducing relative risk by 20%. Not just that, understand that these drugs make patients feel good. For example, GAPA HF, patients felt better. KCC could score significantly increased. Emperor reduced, patients felt better. Paradigm, patients felt better. So these drugs, understand, not just make the patient feel better, they also improve outcome. So whether your patient feels good or bad, whether your patient feels fine, they need these drugs because they improve outcome. And that is extremely important to understand. That is why when we talk about heart failure drug treatment, the fantastic four, meaning today beta blockers, SGLT inhibitors, army and MRA, they individually improve survival and reduce heart failure hospitalization. If they do that, it is our job, our responsibility to write it to every eligible patient we see sitting in front of us. The patient might say, I'm feeling better, but we should say you should take this drug because in the long run, you would do better. So the best time is yes pre-discharge, right? So we should write these drugs pre-discharge, whatever uh, 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 series you do, whichever you drug first and second, if you can put your patient on all four drugs pre-discharge, you do extremely good to him and you get a good outcome. Now the problem is here, if you draw a line in the world map, right? You see world is exactly half, right? On the top you have, for example, countries like Canada, United Kingdom, uh, Canada, US, you have Europe, whole of Europe, Russia, where you have, for example, US has a $3.3 trillion USD as a health budget. 18% of the GDP goes for health. So it comes to about 11,000 USD per person. In contrast, take India. We have our health budget is 36 billion USD, 1.28% of our GDP, which amounts to about 30 USD per person. So this is not a lecture on economics, but the point is this is reality. So, so important thing is we have to adopt to our social, our financial, our background, 
to tailor our therapy and we have to adapt to it. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Yes, the first thing is clinical course of patients, if you see worsening heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, first thing is this. The data by Javed Butler has very clearly shown that most events in heart failure occurs when, look at that first bar, 30 days post-index, so very close to the discharge, which means by the time your patient comes back, you might have already had an event. So in India, the best option would be start maximum as much as possible, maximally tolerated drugs of these four drugs in hospital. So you would say, is there a data? Yeah, we have data. So start treatment in hospital if possible in India to give your patient the best outcome because by the time they come back from the first follow-up, they had already crossed that time when they have maximum events. In hospital initiation, do we have data? You have data. Transition. Okay, look at Pioneer where we looked at change in antiprone NP, CV death or hospitalization, everything showed that it is better you study in hospital. Look at the SGLT individual uh, empathy for the data. Very clearly, if you start in hospital, you benefit. So this is more important in India. Well, in India, cost of hospitalization is not as high as the West. So you keep your patient for two more days in the ward and make sure that if he tolerates, if he tolerates, put him on SGL inhibitors, army, beta blockers, as far as, and, and, uh, as far as possible so that you do him better. All the four drugs need to go in if possible. Okay. Now, if you miss the bus, okay, someone will say, I could not start my patient on in the hospital. Next, start it. But we might actually forget to start it because by the time the patient comes, he or she says, doctor, I'm feeling better. So I want to give you an SGLT inhibitor and RD, which are costly. He said, why doctor, I'm fine. And we might miss it out. So if you miss it out, do have a system. This is the AIMS Redair card, which for example, is a simple card. India specific. In the back, you have a score box, which says the most important cardiac drugs, S inhibitors, beta blockers, statins, and the new cards of SGLT inhibitors and RD. Have you put them or not? It is possible that you or your resident might have forgotten. So which drug comes first? This is important for India because of the background we said. So patient profiling in heart failure. Now, very clearly, one of the drugs that is most well tolerated, whether you have low BP, high heart rate, mostly is the SGLT inhibitors. Okay, each drug has its own problems, but SGLT inhibitors tend to be tolerated better when started early. So the concept, and of course, if you are talking about hypokalemia, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hyponatremia, hyper or hypocalcemia, SGLT inhibitors, none, right? So, one concept is that the conventional sequence of studying heart failure drugs or AC inhibitors, beta blockers, MRAs, that sequence, which we have gradually tightened up. And today we are talking about pre-hospital. Can we start a rapid sequencing? We will start with a beta blocker and an SGLT inhibitor because they are tolerated the best. Add up an RNA and an MRA. So no AC or ARB straight away go for RNA and an MRA. Patient does not tolerate, skip that step. But the point is, try to put your patient on all four if possible. Message number two is heart failure is a bad disease. So try to put your patients on pre-discharge optimized therapy, which would do be good for India. So this is message number two. Third, people ask that, okay, I wish that someday there'll be a vaccine for heart failure, right? Yes, there is one. Not heart failure vaccine, but influenza vaccine. And we often forget about it. Influenza vaccine very clearly showed that from 2003 to 2008, as the vaccination increased, cardiovascular event rate significantly came down. Epidemiology. Okay, what about pneumococcal vaccine? Pneumococcal vaccine data in high risk patients very clearly shows that you reduce all cause mortality by what? About 20 25%. So today it is very important that we vaccinate our patients with pneumococcal vaccine and influenza vaccine. Every society, look at the Heart Failure Society of America data, pneumococcal influenza vaccine. Look at the ACCF HA data, influenza and pneumococcal vaccine. Look at the ESC data. Every guideline says that for heart failure patients, each one of them should be vaccinated for influenza and pneumococcal vaccine. So yes, heart failure is a bad disease, but there is a vaccine. That is important message number three. The last message is this. Heart failure is a bad disease. And we know that anemia is bad. But there's something even worse. And what is that? Yeah, you are right. Iron deficiency. We, we tend to normally in our mind uh, connect iron deficiency to anemia. right? But we today know that iron deficiency has far more implications, including affliction of mitochondria, affliction of LV function, various many ways. But 
We don't want to cloud the physician's mind by going to the nitty gritty. But the point is today, we diagnose iron deficiency rather than anemia in heart failure by looking not just at hemoglobin less than 15, but looking at ferritin less than 100. If the ferritin is between 100 and 299, we look at TSAT of less than 20. So if a patient has a hemoglobin of less than 15, ferritin less than 100, and or 100 to 300 with a TSAT of less than 20%, we diagnose not anemia, but iron deficiency. And if we do that, today we have enough data. For example, this is the confirmed edge of data that on giving IV iron, patients start feeling better. That red line is FCM and the blue is placebo. Very clearly, patients start feeling better when they get IV iron. What about hard endpoints? We don't have data on mortality. But we see that, for example, hospitalization rates have dropped in this particular trial when we gave them IV iron to correct iron deficiency. Okay, and this is the all collected data that came in ACC about IV iron. And very clearly, if you look at heart failure hospitalization, it has come down. Hazard ratio 0.69. What about all cause mortality? What about cardiovascular mortality? Well, there's a tendency for it to be on the left of the line, but statistically not significant. So, last message number four for the physician heart failure treatment heart failure is a bad disease. Anemia is indeed bad. But remember that iron deficiency is worse. And don't forget to treat iron deficiency. So at the end of all this, where are we? There are a couple of important messages in heart failure treatment that you need to remember. Let us recapitulate what we said. Well, number one, physician inertia today is worse than heart failure itself. Heart failure is a bad disease. But today we have excellent drugs available to us. SGLT inhibitors, RNA, MRA, beta blockers. And we need to see, are we missing one of them on our patient? If the patient tolerates, for sure, right? So physician inertia needs to be avoided. Second, adopt and adapt heart failure therapy. For your individual patients in India, depending on your availability, depending on your capability, depending on your system, right? Third, in hospital, early institution of disease-modifying therapy is possible in India. And that perhaps to my mind is the cheapest and most suitable way, sustainable way of doing it in India. Keep your patient for two more extra days. See that, does it tolerate an SGLT inhibitor? Does it tolerate a small dose of, of our knee? If possible, do that. Finally, vaccinate for pneumococcal influenza vaccine. We as cardiologists always look at hemodynamic drugs and we see the changes right in front of our eyes. And often forget, vaccinating our patients for pneumococcus and influenza when they're in heart failure. Do that and don't forget that you can actually give both together in both arms in one single time. Correct, iron deficiency, we're not talking about anemia. The patient may not be anemic, but still can be iron deficiency in a heart failure, correction of it gives him good feeling and perhaps avoiding uh, rehospitalization. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Tiny Nair for such a fantastic presentation. And uh, it was really very well suited for the physicians. Uh, may I, may, do we have time to just ask one question? If there's nothing in the chat box. I, I want to ask something. I want to ask something. Number one, uh, it is as usual, tiny uh, talks in such a way, which is always very practical and clinically applicable. I have nothing to add except two things. One is, Iron profile is class 1A indication in every heart failure assessment. I think this is the biggest problem. The second thing is we have a firm heart failure trial which mandates that you can replace IV elemental iron when the patient is recovering from heart failure pre-discharge, which is another very big black hole. People feel that we can't give iron in the hospitalization phase, they postpone it later on. It does not reduce mortality, but definitely improves quality of life. So I will say a firm heart failure is a very strong evidence for in-hospital IV elemental iron replacement. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tiny, the screening for iron deficiency is class 1C. The treatment is 2A or TB, depending patient is a heart failure. Why this paradox? Why not so much importance to iron? I think what we can forget, Yeah, I think we can forget about those guideline uh, paradoxes and for see uh, anyway, it's not very expensive to check for 
uh, uh, ferritin in hospital. Anyway, we would be doing an antiprobiotic. We would do it so many costly uh, treatments. So I think pre-discharge, everybody should have a serum ferritin done, a hemoglobin done to see, or and if possible, a T-sat done to check for anemia. Absolutely, and correct it if possible. The other issue is that a patient is given ICD because of rejection fraction was 30% or so. After treatment with the four fantastic drugs, the ejection fracture increased to 45, 50. Now the patient who was on ICD, will you ask for a replacement of the battery when his term is over or you will continue without replacement? A big question. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult question to answer because, you know, uh, perhaps there we should go by, because we have no data. We have data that all these four foundational drugs when given together, sudden cardiac death is reduced, inappropriate shocks are reduced, which means, yeah, chance of sudden cardiac death is reduced and his ejection fraction improved. So his chance of an SCD does come down, but are we eligible to say that your battery is over and not replace it simply because you are on four foundational therapies is an individual question. If he says, doctor, I can afford it, why I, you didn't ask me to change it and he dies of a sudden cardiac death, you would be held responsible. So I think we should follow the guideline, replace his battery, but tell him that he's better and there are chances that he will not develop and uh, 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 give an inappropriate shock subsequently. Dr. Sandeep Rai, please. Yeah, sir, I wanted to ask that uh, as physicians, we see a lot of patients with grade one diastolic dysfunction, anybody diabetic with 50. Uh, recently, SGLT2 have been shown to have good effect on preserved ejection fraction heart failure also. So do you think uh, most of these patients should be on SGLT2? And I think... Uh, I think the, the first perception that people feel that diastolic dysfunction by ECHO equals uh, uh, HFPF which is not. HFPF is different, diastolic function is different. See, uh, I might go to the lab tomorrow, get an echo done, which might show diastolic dysfunction. My A wave may be larger than the E wave and the diastolic dysfunction. Does it change anything? Not at all. Right? So diastolic dysfunction by echo in an absolutely healthy person does not warrant any drug at all. We see it's so commonly in the echo. We might have to find out is the ischemic, is he getting more fibrous in the, they say, what is the reason? Okay, that's different. But heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in entity, where patient has a symptom, anti-pro BNP is high, and his ejection fraction is normal, may be associated with diastolic functional abnormality by echocardiogram when we properly assess. Okay, so unless anti-pro BNP is high, unless patient has symptoms, there is no role for uh, SGLT2. Dr. Dr. Raya, just a minute. Dr. Raya, I'll just simplify what Dr. Tiny has said. The basic is heart failure. If you don't have heart failure, there's nothing like diastolic dysfunction to be treated with as GLT2. So all patient of HFPEF will have diastolic dysfunction. All diastolic dysfunction will not have HFPEF. This, this is the way you right. can understand. Right, sir. Those who are uh, who have symptoms or who have uh, increased anti-pro BNP, yeah, you have to document heart failure. So I have Thank one you. question to Dr. Nair. Sir, we do uh, come across patients who are intolerant to AIDS inhibitors or ARBs and who are uh, with uh, ejection uh, you know, they their EGFR is less than 30. They are in grade 4, grade 5 CKD. How do we treat such patients of heart failure? Yeah, so see, if they are tolerating your RAS inhibition within uh, whatever be the GFR, the GFR is not uh, dropping precipitously, we can continue the RAS inhibition. And today we can always supplement it with a beta blockade, supplement it with an MRA, provided the potassium is normal, supplement it with SGLT inhibitors, which are actually very good when we are, we are uh, with a lower uh, GFR. But obviously, if you are talking about an end stage renal failure where you have a GFR which is very poor, all this stuff becomes individualistic and you have to plan up. Perhaps those are ESRD patients and those who might need to go for a renal replacement therapy by hemodialysis or whatever. Thank you, Dr. Tain Nair.
insights from the world's best medical minds, you are watching the right doctors.com.